thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you all so much for having me. It's definitely my honor to be here today. I know, I'm sure you all are studying very hard. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but thank you all again. Um, let me reintroduce myself. I am RJ Mitty. Uh, if you do not know who I am, uh, I have no idea why you're here. Uh, <laughs> but, but thank you all so much. I, uh, it is my pleasure. I, I've been lucky enough to, to be able to travel and, and see amazing things and be a part of amazing events like this today. I, um, I will give you all a little bit about my information uh, about where I come from. I'm originally from Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, I, I, was, I, I was between actually Louisiana and Texas. Part of my family is from Lafayette and part of my family is from uh, Texas. So I was always traveling between the two. So I lived a very interesting childhood and especially when I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Uh, does anyone know what cerebral palsy is? And, and feel free, y'all can raise your hands. I'm not going to chop them off. Um, <laughs> but, um, but for the people that don't, cerebral palsy um, can be caused from a number of things, but it's most commonly caused from lack of oxygen to the brain at childbirth, which happened in my case. Um, I was diagnosed at age three, luckily enough, by a man, my grandmother would go every year, she would travel and trade in her car. She had a Cadillac every year that she would trade up and same man, same, same model, just newer year. And one year I happened to be with her and this man happened to be a Shriner. Uh, he was part of the Brotherhood of the Shrine um, and he worked with the hospitals in the States. Uh, and he goes, oh, does your grandson have cerebral palsy? And, and at the time, they really didn't know what I had. So they were like, uh, well, we don't really know. We know he has something. We don't know what it is. Well, he goes, uh, take him to Shriners Hospitals, which was in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. The first one built, actually, back in... Uh, 1920s, um, during the time that polio was running rampant and, and no one really had, um, no one really had a lot of treatments. No one really knew how to tend to it and it was affecting a lot of lives. And he went, go up there, I promise you, he will be diagnosed. Uh, at the time I was supposed to undergo a hill cord surgery where they would go into my leg and slice the tendons and either lengthen them or shorten them. Uh, during this period, it was very risky. Uh, at the time, about 75% of the people really never walked properly ever again. Uh, and they would have to do it at least one other time. Because the thing is, is, I wouldn't be here today if I had that surgery. I wouldn't have the abilities I have today if I didn't go to this facility. I was three years old, I went up there, I learned, I learned a lot. I was able to grow and, and flourish in, in so many different aspects of my life. I, uh, I, I did therapy treatments, I wore braces, uh, and went through casting and feet binding from three to 13, I wore braces, but from three to 11, about six months every year, both legs were in cast. And uh, I also, I played football in those casts and they came in very, heavy, uh, very handy because it wasn't just a shin guard that I had, but I had a, uh, a whole way around my leg that just, it, it was armor. So I, I, was, I was very good at chucking, just, just planted myself and just had them bounce off me. Um, but I learned a lot and, and, it, and I learned at a very young age that casts are water soluble. Who knew? Um, but, uh, but I would do a lot of different things, like I would slip and fall into the pool. Uh, I, I would slip and fall into the bathtub and, and again at the time they only came in two colors. They came in black and they came in white. So what ends up happening is being from Louisiana and the region that I'm, I'm from, it's going to get extremely hot or it's going to get extremely dirty. So I always went for the slick look so I stuck with black. Um, so it got extremely hot. 
So I used to take coins and I would freeze the coins and I would drop them into these casks. And over time, the coins would build because I didn't really think it through. I, uh, I, I, I it just so I, I would put them in, but I couldn't really get them out. <laughs> And over time, I would be walking around and pretty much it would just be like shing, shing as I would t every, for every step. And over time, I'd start complaining and I'd be like, my feet are killing me. I, I'm in so much pain. And my mom would drive me five hours north to go cut them off and put new ones on. And they would cut them off. And, and keep in mind, these things did not smell the best. Uh, but when they would do this, all this change would pour out and I'd have all these dead presidents all over my legs. It, it looked like I had leprosy. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was the things like this that, that taught me lessons. It taught me what I needed to do. It taught me different aspects of, of who I am and what I stand for. And it gave me the tools to carry over into my, um, my routines and my work. And I was about 12, 13 years old when I had the privilege uh, of moving to Los Angeles. And I, I moved there because of my little sister. We were in Texas at the time, and an agent saw her and was like, oh my God, she's perfect. Now please keep in mind, she was only one and a half. So she was far from perfect, uh, but, but she has bright red hair. And they were like, we're doing the Lucille Ball campaign. We would love to use her for this campaign. Uh, and luckily, it was a woman saying this, because if it was a man, it would be fairly creepy. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but they're like, we'd love to use her for this campaign. It, it's, it's, a, uh, it's the Lucille Ball campaign. And we're like, sure, of course. So we go out there, and she starts working. And as she starts working you know, this campaign, they're like, we would love to have her for other projects. So what ended up happening is they're like, you know, she needs an agent. She ha you know, every one and a half year old, uh, they gotta have that agent. You know, you know, they, they just gotta. So as we're starting looking at agents for her, this, uh, this woman comes out and, and with a very smoker voice, uh, I, I couldn't do it, but she's like, oh, what about your son? And my mother's going, uh, well, you know, he, it's like, you know, this, is, this isn't really the business for him. Um, he has CP. Um, like, like, you know, he gets said no enough to. And, and the business is a very negative business. This industry is not what it always perceives to be. It, it's very uh, negative and, and harsh. And, and very harsh to people. Uh, with disabilities because of the idea of perfection, the idea of what people perceive as perfection, which, which technically does not exist. And I, uh, I was like, ah, sure, why not? Because, you know, if you move to Los Angeles and you don't go to school, you don't join a gang, you don't act, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to meet anyone. You're not going to have friends. So it ended up I was like, yes, I would love to do this. And I started working as an extra. I was working on 13 different shows all at the same time. I, I recommend if anyone in this room wants to throw their hat at acting, um, signing up for extra work. It's a really, it's a great opportunity to, to see a set unfold in front of your eyes. It's a great opportunity to see uh, lead actors that have been working for five to 10 and 20 years. Uh, watching these sets, it was amazing. It gave me tools. I was working on about 13 different sets all within six months. Then I got the opportunity to audition for Breaking Bad. And I was about 13, 14 years old when this uh, happened. And I, I went in, I auditioned five times, four in Los Angeles, once in New Mexico. and. Two of them were side by side. I auditioned one day in New Mexico, uh, in Los Angeles. Next day, I flew out to New Mexico and then auditioned. I got there around 7:30, 7 7:30. Uh, 7, I auditioned around that same time. I went back up to my room. Uh, they called me back down and, and for a test screening. And a, and a test screening is where they introduce you to the lead actor. They want to make sure that you aren't crazy or you're going to freak out or do anything weird. 
They want to make sure they can still fire you. That's, that's the key thing. Uh, so I went down and, and they assume, I'm assuming they liked me because they ended up hiring me. Uh, <laughs> but I, I went back up to my room and they, they called me and were going, okay, so this is it. You, you, you got the part, congratulations. All right, hurry up, get back to Los Angeles and come back to New Mexico. You're late. Um, I'm, I'm like, I just got hired. You're already late. Um, so I, I, I flew back to LA and then packed up my bag and shot, and then flew back to New Mexico and shot the pilot. And it just continued to grow. And, and at the time, we, didn't, we knew we had something special. We knew we had something unique, that, that nothing on television had been done before like this. And we were able to have so much fun doing it and creating a story that was real in a sense. I, I, I tell a lot of people that this wasn't story driven, this was character driven. This was a, a story that these characters went on this journey and, and it had an arc and every character had an arc and it was like real life. No one in this world doesn't, no, no one's a, a one dimensional character. Everyone is a real person and that's what we're very lucky to have and, and have. And, and through this, I was able to be a part of amazing organizations. Uh, in the States, I work with quite a few different ones. I work with Shriners Hospitals for Children. I sit on the board of SAG and AFTRA's Diversity Committee. I work um, with my grandparents' foundation out of Austin, Texas. That's a nonprofit foundation. I, um, I, I speak out, and I have been recently, in the past couple of months, talking and working with SCOPE. Uh, as you can see, uh, which is an amazing organization and I continue to learn more and more about them every day and me and them have very similar ideas of what needs to happen and that is changing a mindset, changing how people perceive not just disability but the human condition itself because so many people have these stigmas and they look at disability. They look at what they think is weakness and illness and that you have to recover from and overcome from. And yes, you do have to overcome this. You do have to grasp and learn and, and take control. But the thing about it is, is it's not weakness. It's actually a strength. It's knowledge. It's something that you can utilize and learn from and it will push you. And yes, you may fail and you may lose this battle. But the thing is, if you never try to overcome your, your weaknesses, if you never try to overcome these, these challenges, and that's exactly what it is, is a challenge. It's a challenge, it's a personal challenge to yourself. And everyone in this room, everyone around the world has these challenges. It may not be physical, it may not be mental. Well, I mean, I think everyone has a little bit of mental uh, challenge every once in a while. But, um, but I, it, it's, it's so many different things and everyone faces these. But if you don't step out of a realm of comfort, if you don't try to better that and better yourself, you will never be able to be who you are truly meant to be. And there are times and there are things that will happen in front of your eyes, in front of your face, where you will have an opportunity to change your life. But this is the thing, is it just does not change your life. It and it does not just change the person that you will be affecting. But the people that are watching, the people that are around you, they see this, they see you. We're in an age of access. We have access like no other. Who in this room is on social media? Come on, I, I think everyone in this room. Uh, don't, that one you don't have to raise your hand to because that was a stupid question. Um, but. We all have access, and there's so many times where people see us, and I will give you an example of that. And I learned this firsthand. I was around 14 years old. Um, I was waiting for my mother to come out of a bathroom, uh, and as I'm waiting for her, I'm in a long corridor, and it's, it's, it's not covered, and it's raining, and it's a little slick, and, and I see this elderly woman as she's walking by, and there's probably 20 
30 people in this corridor. And as she passes me, I don't, I don't think anything of it. I, I like to, uh, I like to, I'm one of those people I watch everyone and I'm, I'm like, I'm, I see where their hands are now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, as she passes me and she's going towards the bathroom and I'm waiting for her, she ends up, she slips and she falls. Well, I'm not close to her, I, I, but I'm not far. I'm, I'm probably as far as the row in front uh, to me, to her. And I see this, and I'm expecting people to help. I'm expecting people to, to, to check on her. Well, I actually see the complete opposite. I see people stepping over her. I see people stepping around her. I see people turning their back and getting out of, get, trying to run away from this. And as this is happening, I, I go over to her and I start talking to her and my family was in home health. So we, we, we checked on the elderly, uh, elderly, uh, mentally disabled, uh, and a few other different conditions. Um, so I knew not to lift her immediately. I knew not to talk to her and make sure. Uh, but as I, I'm doing this, my mom comes over and starts checking on her as well. But as this is going on, the same people that stepped over her, the same people that, that went around her and, and turned their back to her, they came back. They started coming back to help. And I'm looking at them like, you're, you're too late. And this old lady, she, she gets up and runs, pretty much. I never, I, she, she moved faster getting away than she did when she was coming in. I think she, that was the fastest she ever moved in probably 50 years. Um, <laughs> but, People knew what they did. They knew what they saw. They knew that they made a mistake. They knew that they should have helped. And this is the thing, is they had that opportunity. They could have been that first person. They could have been that person to check and make sure she was all right. But they were afraid. <clears throat> they were afraid. They used, they were so used to being manipulated by fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of, of making a difference, the fear of stepping out of a realm of comfort. And they allowed themselves to, to feel this fear. And that's what they avoided her. They were afraid of what to come. And this is the thing is you cannot let fear rule you. You cannot let fear manipulate you because people will use it against you. People will use that fear and that fear will be uh, you, you will lose who you are. You will lose pieces of you, who you were meant to be, who you could have been. And if you allow people to take it away from you, you will never prosper, you will never grow, you will never have the impact that you are meant to have. Being in this facility today, you are working so hard towards that greater goal, and that is to have a better life, not just for you, but for your family to give your friends a better future, to give yourself a higher elevation of, of learning, uh, of life. And when people see you, they will hold you to a higher regard. But the thing about that is, is when they see you, what do you want to be known for? What do you want to have? What, what's the impact that you can and will have on society? You have the ability. Everyone in this world has this ability. People choose not to. They choose to back down. They choose to be afraid. So many people in this time, and, and I grew up with bullies. I grew up with so many different things that were against me. People used my disability against me. I had my hand broken. I had my foot broken. I was pushed. I was shoved. I, I, I dealt with it. But the thing is, is, I never allowed it to manipulate me. I never allowed the fear to be instilled in who I was and what I'm capable of. You know, I grew up with a Marine grandfather, so it was, you, you never said can't, you never said won't. Trust me, you didn't want to. Uh -huh. I never allowed that, and I never allowed people to say, I can't do something. I had many people saying, I can't play soccer or football. Um, I, I had many people saying that I would never walk properly or talk properly. I would never make anything of myself. I would never have a life on my own. I'd never have a normal existence. And that was a lie. Because if they were me, that's what they would believe. And this is the thing, is people throw their fears. And when they see disability, they see this fear.
that it could happen to me, that's going to be me, that could have been me, and then allows them to throw these insecurities, and it, and it shouldn't. Because when you get into a place of believing you cannot do something, when you believe that you won't be able to, to live up to, to whatever your idea of living is, you will, believe, you will believe that and you won't be able to because you, you think that. And that's the thing it is everyone in this room has the potential to do whatever they want. You have the abilities, you have the knowledge, and you have the know-how. You choose not to. You choose not to grow. You choose not to flourish. Anyone that tells you you can't is lying to you. And you can't allow that. So, <laughs> um, you know, there's times in my life where I believe I couldn't do this. I couldn't, I won't be able to, to grow. And I'm, I'm always afraid that one day uh, my disability will take that back. And that's the thing is, is I cannot be afraid. Because if I am afraid, it will happen. So I try to avoid that. I try to overcome that. And I try to continue to push myself into different directions that are scary, that do make me fearful. But the thing is, is I don't allow myself. And you cannot let fear manipulate you. you know, that's, that's why I do work with these organizations. That's why I'm able to achieve what I want, is because of that fear and that type of fear. Because if I let that consume who I am, I lose pieces of me. And I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I have people that are working towards a greater goal and working towards seeing people and an equality for people. Because the thing about disability is disability doesn't just affect one culture. Disaf disability affects all life, all people, e even animals. <laughs> uh, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. You will and can be affected by a disability and a challenge. And that challenge, will you face it or will you run from it? And that will define who you will become. Because if you run, you'll be running the rest of your life. And you cannot allow that. Because you are here. You are working so hard to create this world for yourself. You know, I, uh, I've been lucky enough to work in this industry and see amazing things, be in amazing places. I get to see a lot of people for who they are and what they're capable of. And I repeat this quite a few times, but, but people, the human nature, is capable of anything. And that's, that's one of the things that people will always surprise you. And you can never let that doubt hold what you are capable of. You know, there's, I, I, I see, again, I see so many things, but it's amazing to see the impact that one person can have on so many people just by watching. And, and now, with that being said, you know, as I mentioned Instagram, uh, social media earlier, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect who you are and what you stand for. And, and how many times have people in this room posted something that you're like, take that down? And I think everyone in this room knows this. But you have to be careful. Now more than ever, people see you. People see what you stand for and what you are doing. And people will try to use that against you. You know, we can get all over the world with one click of a button. We have that type of access. We have that type of media source. And this being said, one click of a button can destroy what you represent what you stand for and who you are. And I'll, I'll give you another little story about that. I had a friend who, who graduated uh, college. He, he spent way too long in college. But he, he graduated with, with quite a few degrees, quite a few different, um, just, just anything you could ever think, honors, uh, an extra master, just, just dude was, he was too smart for his own good. I mean, I think we all know a few people like that. Uh, zero common sense. But he, uh, he loved social media. And he would post and he would respond and he was always, 
he was always taking photos. And this is the thing is, as he graduated, it, that died off. That, 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 that just kind of went to the back burner because he was working. Well, he goes and starts applying for positions. And as he's applying for these jobs, he finds one job in particular that loved him and that he loved them because they were going to pay him a significant amount of money. <laughs> uh, very uh, uh, a good wage, good benefits. Like, like this was his first job and he was like, oh my God, this is, this is a dream come true. He applies, they, they accept, they do the interview. What ends up happening is they're like, oh, we love you, you're perfect for our company, you are what we represent. They, um, they, they say, we will call you back. We'll call you back in a week. We, we have some stuff. We have to move some people around because of the, the position that is opening. And what ends up happening is he, he doesn't get a call. About a week later, no one had calls. He's like, they, I, I, they said they love me. They say they, they wanted me. Why didn't they call me? And we're like, hey, man, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> but um, about a, a couple of days after that conversation, uh, he gets a call. And they say, we would love to see you. Please come in. We, we need to talk to you. And he's like, oh, they, they need to talk to me. They, they're, they're really excited. Um, needing to talk to someone can mean two very different things. <laughs> Well, he goes in, he goes into HR, and they start talking to him, and they say, we called you in for one reason, and we wanted to tell you why you're not getting the job. And he's like, wait, what? You called me in for that? And he said, yes, because next time you apply, we want you to see what is, and what people see of you, and what, what, you're, what you are perceived as. And he goes, what are you talking about? And they hand him a book. And this book is about this thick. And I got, I got to see a little bit of this book. Oh, I, I don't know what happened to it. I think he might have burned it, though. But, um, <laughs> but this book contained his Twitter, his Facebook, his Instagram, um, anything that you could possibly think of. Things that were private, like Tinder, all that. Like, and, and he's like, um... Okay then, and he starts flipping through these pages, and it's one-sided conversations. It's conversations that he posted and that he had, and photos that other people posted and they had. And he said, this is what you represent. And he did not like what he saw because that is not who he was. That is not what he stood for. That is not what brought him and what he was training for. And it, it destroyed that job opportunity. And this is the thing, is when you have a social media life, when you are being out in the public like that, pretty soon this will be your new resume. I hate to say it like this, but people will look at that to see what you represent, what you stand for, who you are, because that tells you what you post, what you say, how you respond, the wording you use, everything that you put out into the internet represents you and one day they will use this they will see this and as you do apply and you do submit your graduations and your diplomas they will also be looking at your social media networks and you have to protect yourself you have to protect what you stand for and who you represent because again they will use this against you and with that being said you have an opportunity through that to have a tremendous impact around the world, to have an impact that, that people will see instantly at the click of a button. So on that note, thank you all so much. I, 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 this starts a Q&A portion of this. Who thought I was gonna be talking about Breaking Bad, huh? Yeah, well you were wrong. <laughs> but, but really, thank you all so much. Is there any questions?